Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum of Iowa. The Iowa History 101 webinars presented on the second and fourth Thursdays of each month explore Iowa's history from pre-statehood to current day. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today, we will discuss the residents, agriculture, and conditions of county poor farms in the Midwest and explore how those in Iowa compared to others in the region. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being re recorded and will be placed on the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Kennedy Heimerdinger is watching and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Megan Burke. Megan is a professor of history at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, specializing in rural and agricultural history, childhood and family history, and the late 19th century. Her first book, Fostering on the Farm, Child Placement in the Rural Midwest, won the DeSantis Prize for the best first book from the Society for the History of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And her most recent book, The Fundamental Institution, Poverty, Social Welfare, and Agriculture in the American Poor Farms was recently released. Megan currently serves as the Vice President, President-Elect of the Midwestern History Association and is a Provost Fellow at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And now I'm very happy to turn over to Megan to begin the webinar. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thanks to everyone who's here sharing your lunch hour or taking kind of a midday break. Uh, I'm very excited to be able to talk to everyone today uh, to talk a little bit about poor farms. Um, and so I thought it would probably be a good idea to start today by talking about what I, what I mean when I say poor farm. There are an enormous number of synonyms for the institution itself. So in Iowa, as I'm sure many of you are aware, they tended to be referred to as county homes. But in other parts of the Midwest even, there was a, a laundry list of other terminology that included things like county infirmary, uh, county almshouse, sometimes just the county farm was the way that people referred to these institutions. So when I say poor farm, I'm including all of those as a group. Um, and so that tends to be kind of the a good baseline term that helps include as many states and places as possible. So I wanted to talk first about poor farms in the region because I suspect some of you who are attending today have a little familiarity with poor farms in Iowa or remember a little something about your county home. Um, but poor farms were in the Midwest everywhere. They are in fact one of the most common, if not the most common type of institution in the region during the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. The Midwest has the, the kind of largest density of poor farms anywhere in the United States. So we have states uh, like my home state of Ohio, where every single county had a poor farm, at least at some point in their history, Almost all of Iowa's counties opened one at some point, and that characteristic is very common across the region. The only other region that comes close is the Northeast, and they had some modifications to theirs. Uh, they had institutions that cared for the poor uh, and the unhoused, who uh, really functioned more like almshouses or workhouses and didn't necessarily have a farm attached at all. So one of the distinctive characteristics of the institutions in the Midwest is that we're talking about an institution that cares for the county's poor uh, and people who are in need of assistance, sometimes temporary, sometimes long-term. But then we're also talking about having a farm attached to that institution. And I will talk more about the agricultural component here in a little while. One of the reasons that they existed at all was because in early state constitutions, the burden of caring for a community's poor fell to counties or some form of local government. So across the Midwest on the whole, 
that tended to be the county that sort of absorbed that responsibility. But counties did not always begin with an institution. There is usually an evolution of dilemmas and financial decisions that led to the point where we've got counties acquiring farmland, spending the money to build an institution or purchase one and move on from there. And that process often began with expenses related to aid. So we've got counties that incur the responsibility of taking care of people who are dependent in some way, whether that means they are an orphan or they are uh, ill and unable to take care of themselves or they are homeless or unhoused in some capacity that then kind of falls to the county. We're dealing with most places that don't have any sort of nonprofit infrastructure during this time period. And so counties began by paying what we would think of as direct aid. They would cover grocery bills. They sometimes paid rent. They often provided fuel. They paid a lot of doctor's bills. So if someone got sick and couldn't work and that was kind of threatening their family and their home, counties would step in and pay for the doctor's bill. But what they came to find out was that there were a number of problems with doing this on kind of a case by case basis. Some counties had a lot of cases. Places like Dubuque, for example, in the 1840s, their single largest county budget item was relief expenses. Um, so it became not just a financial burden, but it also became kind of a time burden. We had county officials who were responsible for that, who were spending a lot of time dealing with individual bills for doctor's payments, uh, paying someone to house a person and take care of them because they couldn't do it for themselves. And so they're accruing these expenses that they're also spending a lot of time. So the step to get from paying for that type of aid and assistance for certain people to building or buying an institution was one that varied depending on where we are. In Iowa, voters tended to have to approve that measure. And so that makes Iowa a little different from some of their Midwestern neighbors. In other places, county officials would be elected and then county officials could decide whether or not they were gonna spend county money to build an institution. But across the state of Iowa, we have voter approval taking place. And some of those votes provide us an interesting window into how people felt as voters about paying for this type of relief. So one, uh, one early vote in 1865 in Marshall County uh, was soundly defeated. It was 129 votes for and 734 against. So not even close. We're not even in the vicinity of voters supporting that measure. But we can see kind of people's ideas and, and belief systems changing a little bit over the course of that next decade, uh, in part because Civil War veterans were one of the groups that needed assistance sometimes. So in 1875, Mills County uh, had their vote, 1,200 for and 400 against, a walloping victory for Mills County to invest in a poor farm. But here was the criticism that was lobbed against the 400 votes for no. It is a matter of deep regret that so many were to be found in the county so occupied with their own schemes that they not only took no interest in, but actually tried to defeat the will of more liberal minded and more humane men. So you could have an overwhelming yes and still have people highly criti critical of those people who voted no. So this step into institutional care, it happens at different points in different counties history. We've got some that go very early. Dubuque, for example, faced with that kind of mounting expense of direct aid, purchased their first farm in the late 1840s. But then we can see later counties, counties that are in fact being developed later to some extent, who are kind of coming online later and making those decisions later in the 1800s. And in fact, some even into the 1900s in states like Iowa and Minnesota. So it, it depends very greatly on the county, the county's needs, uh, the number of dependents they're taking care of, as to when they decide, uh, or if they decide, to go ahead and take this step. There are sometimes questions about what it took to live at the poor farm, how people were admitted, and what the responsibilities were. And one of the, I think, largest misconceptions is that people had to work in order to stay at these places. The thing about that concept is that it, it sort of aligns with our ideas today of means testing to some extent. We expect there to be sort of a process where you prove that you need the service. 
But for the most part, the people who are moving into a poor farm as residents, whether it's a short term stay or a long term stay, are specifically there because they cannot do enough work to support themselves outside the institution. That's not necessarily a permanent condition for all of these people, but it is certainly a temporary one. And so they are not actually capable of doing the type of heavy labor required to run an institution and a farm at the same time. So we do have residents who are helping. They pitch in, they do chores, they might work in the barn a little bit, but they are not actually providing enough labor for the most part to run a farm on their own labor. Um, we have lots of county stewards and superintendents, people who are in charge of the poor farm, who comment on this on a pretty regular basis. They say things like the value of resident labor is zero. Some of them remark that it's not even worth their time to try to force people to work because it's more effort than it's worth to go through that whole process. So we have people here who contribute uh, if they're able to, but they are not actually sort of working in exchange for their housing at the poor farm uh, most of the time. There are always a few exceptions to that. Uh, sometimes people who were believed to be able-bodied but lazy are kind of expected to pull their own weight, but those people in respect to the overall poor farm populations are really few and kind of far between. One superintendent just kind of summarized his group this way. He had 25 residents, a number of whom are aged, infirm, and unable to work. And that's a pretty solid summary of kind of most poor farms at this kind of period in time. The poor farm is providing for people basic necessities. They're providing food, they're providing shelter, and to the surprise of maybe some, they are providing health care. Remember that that's one of the most expensive components of the type of aid they're kind of evolving out of. And so doctors were under contract at county farms. They did come out on a regular basis. They did take care of acute problems, uh, a pop-up illness and injury, but they also took care of residents who had chronic issues, um, people dealing with a cancer diagnosis or dealing with long-term tuberculosis. Uh, they came when women gave birth sometimes if it was deemed necessary. And so we've got a lot of medical care happening at poor farms, even without necessarily any kind of recognition that this is serving, not really as a county hospital necessarily, but definitely as a point of health care for certain people in the community. We have people coming and going from the poor farm a lot. There are short term stays, a couple of nights here, maybe a few weeks or a few months, and then people leave. We also have people who stay a long time, people who are there for decades, people who essentially kind of make it their home. And it just varies on a person to person basis what their need is and how long they'll be there. We also have a lot of seasonal laborers who end up at poor farms. We see the populations in poor farms spike during the winter time. So once we get clear of that harvest season, we tend to see, especially in our rural counties, the number of poor farm residents go up for the winter. And then once we hit springtime and it's planting season and people are kind of prepping the soil and they're looking for a part-time hired hand, we see those people kind of head back out at the out of the poor farm, but they're not necessarily making enough money during the course of that seasonal cycle to provide a full-time home for themselves. And so the poor farm serves as this kind of stopgap measure for a lot of folks. We also have really good examples of acute crises, um, people who have a house fire, for example, or someone whose husband has been put in prison and they have nowhere to go, no way to pay rent. Sometimes the poor farm provides that kind of really short-term assistance that people need before they can figure out what's next. Find a family member to step in and help, find a job, find some other kind of outlet to help provide care. So the poor farms did both of these things. They're providing short-term care sometimes and then long-term care for others. And it just depends who the person is and kind of what they're dealing with. And so we see both of these populations in the institution all at the same time. This speaks a little bit to the conditions inside institutions, which is always a sort of fascinating topic to dive into because the quality of the poor farm experience varied widely. We have some counties that have a really good system. The institution is clean. The food is good. People are being well cared for. And then we can go one county over and it's sort of a, a Victorian era almshouse nightmare. The conditions vary based on who is in charge, uh, 
the quality of the actual institution building itself, um, the investment that the county has made financially, whether they're paying to have good care provided or not. And so we get this sort of wide array of conditions and they change over time. Sometimes a good manager could come into a badly run institution and make it better. And the inverse is also true. You could take a good institution and make it terrible really pretty quickly. One of the reasons we know this is because by the late 1800s, most states are sending inspectors into poor farms. But this is a little bit of a, a sticky wicket because the states have no actual authority here. These are county run institutions and they are county funded institutions. There is almost no money being exchanged hands between the state and counties for care. So without that string attached, states are allowed to make suggestions and request that changes are made, but they don't actually have any enforcement ability. Um, and so the inspections take place and they use the power of sort of embarrassment and peer pressure. I'll give you a great example. Um, an inspector went to Buchanan County in 1912. And then in the newspaper uh, and in the sort of public report about that visit said the following, the distinction of being one of the oldest and one of the worst in the state. Uh, they were still using their building from 1865 for what that's worth. So what the state inspector did there is what state inspectors across the Midwest did. They compared one bad county with other better counties and used that as a way to sort of shame county officials and voters into doing better. You are one of the worst in the state. This is terrible. And it's not just Iowa that did that. It's actually all over the region. We see this sort of language being used to try to motivate counties to have a nicer institution. It worked. Buchanan County voted to build a new farm, but that vote barely passed. Um, so that peer pressure applied did at least um, make them feel as though they needed to step up their care game a little bit. One of the reasons that poor farms had all of this variance in terms of what it was like to live there has to do with the number of people and the types of people who lived in poor farms. They are truly a clearinghouse for anyone in the community who lives there and needs help. So we have, especially in the late 1800s, women who are pregnant and single and are going there because they need a safe place to give birth. We have women who are in the middle of a domestic dispute and they're fleeing with their children to the poor farm. We have elderly people who have no family to take care of them or whose family refuses to provide care. We've got injured people, chronically sick people. We have people dealing with mental illnesses who do not have access to a different type of institution. And we have people with a wide array of disabilities, people with physical disabilities, people with cognitive disabilities, all living in the same house, all sharing the same roof. And so those conditions meant that because this is not an institution that provides specific care and treatment for any of those issues, they're just trying to provide food and shelter and health care to people uh, to give them a decent place to spend the amount of time they need to spend. And so there's no real treatment being applied here for people who might need that, but it also makes it a very difficult institutional environment in which to live sometimes, but also to manage. This is where our issue of rules comes in. Lots of counties had lists of rules at the poor farm. And just like all rules, I think, we can read them. And when we read them from a distance, we think, whoa, they really, you know, dropping the hammer on these people. And then we have to look at how they're being applied and followed, and particularly if they're being applied and followed. And that is, in this circumstance, a big if. There were lots of good intentions with rules. One uh, advice book for poor farms said that you should use temperate firmness, but enforced with all paupers on the rules of the house. Whatever temperate firmness meant to that particular person. So rules that they did follow pretty consistently were a physical separation of genders inside the institution. They did not want men and women mingling inside the poor farm um, for anything other than social purposes. So they tended to have an architectural design that isolated uh, people based on gender. They did not really want any alcohol use inside the institution. And they tried to prevent people, men especially, from going to town to get alcohol and then coming back being intoxicated. 
they tried very hard to get people to at least sort of do a little activity around the house or around the barn uh, to keep them busy and active so that they didn't just sort of sit and stew. Um, but that's a real mixed bag in and of itself. And they tried very hard to make sure that there was nothing violent or untoward happening inside the institution. But these are not, despite the fact that they sometimes called residents inmates, carceral institutions. People come and go freely, even when the rules say that they shouldn't. Um, there are often rules about you can't leave without permission and you can't be admitted without permission, but those are not followed particularly well. People come and go, sometimes people leave without permission. They come back a few months later and someone lets them in. Uh, and so we have a lot of coming and going happening. There are some examples, especially in the 1870s and 1880s, of shootings. Uh, we've got one poor farm murder in Iowa in 1879 where a resident actually was allowed to keep his rifle. And so he murdered a fellow resident he didn't like very much on the 4th of July. We have a superintendent who actually stabbed another resident um, because they were sort of attacking him. So we see some of these pieces of evidence that suggest that especially in the early decades of poor farm life, things are maybe a little more rough and tumble than we would expect, uh, particularly for institutions that are caring for the elderly, the sick, um, the vulnerable of communities. Counties sometimes followed, not really rules, but recommendations about where to place the poor farm, what kind of farm to buy. Often the land was the leading motivator here. Counties are buying a farm as an investment. They do expect that it will contribute to the institution, but they also recognize that they are spending a fair amount of taxpayer dollars on something that they expect to be kind of reinvested into the county and that will provide an asset that is, a, you know, accruing value over time. So they took special care sometimes to buy land that was good quality, that had water, um, if they didn't have to install things like drain tiles or do a bunch of ditching, that was usually preferable. But they also didn't want to put the poor farm so far away from everything that it was really hard to get to. This might seem a little counterintuitive. We tend to think of poor farms as being specifically isolated, but it actually was expensive to isolate them. If you put them really, really far away from a town, really, really far away from a road, it was gonna cost you more to get the doctor there. It was gonna cost the county officials more on their per diem to get out there to look at it. It was gonna cost you more to get groceries. It was gonna cost more to ship your farm items out. And so typically, although not always the case, we find poor farms a few miles away from a town, usually on a main road, sometimes tucked way off the road up a big drive um, on land the county has given a lot of thought to and care to um, as to where it is. You can also kind of see some of the interesting architectural pieces on the images that I have on this slide. Um, so from top to bottom, this is Crawford County and then Chickasaw County. And then uh, the bottom one is Benton County uh, down by Benton. Um, you can see right off the bat that these look a little bit alike, especially those bottom two. The elevation of the building is very similar. The symmetry on both sides and the depth, the, the literal length of the institution. We've got those windows in the soffit. Um, we've got the same kind of porch set up. We've got just very similar uh, architectural styles. And then we got a little bonus. So we've got these really pretty arched windows up here. Um, the Chickasaw County has this really interesting, almost like picture sort of picture window, but it's it's brickwork that's been done. And then we can see in the Crawford picture, this is sort of a scaled down version. It's a smaller version of the bottom two, but the elevation is the same. They've picked some nice stonework to kind of accent the front. The architecture of poor farms mattered, and we can see counties making improvements through the architecture, and we can also see them making a statement about the way that their county takes care of its dependents. We have some of these that are very similar. In other states across the Midwest, we had huge brick structures, four and five stories tall. Some of them had turrets. Some of them have little towers. Some of them have a mansard style roof, almost like a French chateau style. It serves no purpose in terms of the care that's being provided, but it does show visitors to the county that the county intends to take care of people well, and they have built the structure to kind of demonstrate their generosity and largesse. So it's interesting to see that architecture pan out. 
We can also though see it doing specific form and function for the institution. So sometimes we'll get an institution that has a separate building that houses people who would have at the time been labeled insane, uh, but we're dealing with a variety of mental health care issues and sometimes uh, dis disability issues, um, but were labeled under that that 19th century heading. They have a separate building. Sometimes there is a sick ward that is a separate structure. Sometimes it's just inside the institutional building itself. We've got a wing or a ward of some kind where those people are being kind of contained. Every once in a while, we'll find an account where we've got people living in the attic or people who have been segregated in the basement. Uh, and you can see both of those kind of levels in all of these pictures. Uh, it, it's a hit or miss as to whether or not those were used to house people or not, but it tended to be a little dangerous to do so. It was unhealthy to keep people um, in the hot attic or the cold attic. Um, it was frequently a site of fires when you did that, and so you had to be careful about how that was being handled. And they had to worry about different types of illness. So they're figuring out ways to isolate people who are physically sick, sometimes contagious, sometimes people dealing with mental illness are segregated inside the institution. And then they worried about contagion and fire. Fire could be devastating for poor farms, and it happened reasonably commonly. Um, one account from Iowa in Washington County, which had a fire, that newspaper story reported that it cremated five women who were residents and got trapped inside the building. Um, a fire destroyed the Floyd County home in 1920. And when Floyd County rebuilt, there was an interesting discussion that was had amongst voters because the new building had plumbing inside it. And some of the voters expressed anger and distress that poor people at the poor farm would have plumbing when most of the voters in Floyd County did not have that kind of privilege in their own homes. Um, but counties usually justified it as a safety measure. It was really dangerous to have open hearths inside poor farms, uh, given the variety of types of residents who live there. And so they had lots of discussions about sometimes paying for steam heat, for example, was deemed a luxury by some, but a safety issue uh, on the part of counties and often state inspectors as well kind of commented on that. So one of the big kind of pressing questions is who our poor farm populations are. And this is something that changes over time. When we look at records from the late 19th century, we see a younger population of poor farm residents and they tend to stay for shorter periods of time. So we have more children in poor farms during the late 1800s. We have more single women who have had a child. We have more women with children there. Um, we also have more transient in and out, people using it almost like overnight lodging when they are moving from place to place. But by the time we get to the early and mid 20th century, the population of poor farms has aged considerably. There are a number of reasons for this and it is a sort of region-wide and nationwide trend. One of the reasons is that lots of other options opened up for different populations of people. So for example, if we think about children, we have lots of different types of children's homes and orphanages that are opening in the late 1800s. They are siphoning children out of poor farms intentionally to get them out of this type of institution. But we also have more types of aid for women uh, who are vulnerable and have children. Um, we have a variety of other institutions like asylums, uh, tuberculosis sanitariums, other institutions who are picking up people out of poor farms and moving them out of that space. And those people tended to skew a little younger. So in the 20th century, we get elderly people who have no family connections or whose family connections have been severed in some way. We have people who are dealing with some type of disability that makes it impossible for them to kind of self-support outside of the poor farm. And so those ages tend to skew a little older. That ultimately kind of changes in the long run, uh, a lot of different things about the institution and the existence of the institutions more broadly. We have, generally speaking, people whose families were not able to care for them or were not willing to care for them. And some of this just has to do with kind of changing notions of who you're obligated to help care for. It also has to do a little bit with the stigma of being in a poor farm. Obviously, older people often are kind of, we're familiar with the threat of being sent to the poor farm as a sort of threat of abandonment, that your children are not going to take care of you, they're not gonna provide the service and you're gonna end up in this place where people who have no connections end up. 
And so that is a sort of motivating factor for some people to not go there if at all possible. Um, we have some accounts, a couple from Iowa of people choosing to not go to the poor farm and a couple of them froze to death during some bad winter storms because their housing was essentially kind of a lean to uh, in somebody's back lot. But the population metrics are interesting. 1910 tends to be a sort of peak year for poor farm population. And the US did take national uh, population gauges of these institutions beginning in 1880. So 1910, sort of a peak year, we've got around 80,000 people who are in poor farms across the US on one single census day. Um, that's not the whole year put together, it's just a single census day. But in Iowa, that single census day found 1,700 people living in Iowa's 94 poor farms at that moment in time. 1,100 of them were men. And that number will skew even wider um, to more men by the time we get to the 1920s and 1930s. Women, even elderly women, tended to be taken in by a family member because they sometimes could still provide help around the house or they could sit with a baby or a child. They could provide some service. Um, men tended to not be taken in because their work on the farm or at a business uh, was really dependent on physical labor sometimes, and they weren't physically able to do that anymore. Um, so 1,100 of them were men. 1,000 of them were native born. That demographic tidbit is different between counties. The demographics of poor farms in the Midwest tended to reflect the demographics of a county. So for counties where there was a mine operation or a lumbering opportunity, we see more immigrants in those counties and we have more immigrants in the poor farms. Um, if a county is known for having, uh, you know, descendants of people who came from Norway or Sweden, we'll see more of those folks in the poor farm as well. So there's a reflection of county demographics in each particular county home or farm. Some of the poor farms in Iowa in 1910 were really small. The smallest had just a couple of residents. It was essentially being run as a farm, a for-profit farm for the county and less for the residents. So uh, places like Adams, Audubon, Dickinson County, Winnebago, very few residents reported in 1910. And there were a host of others that had less than 10. Those places are really operating almost like an interesting family home or dynamic because of how small they were. Um, but the biggest at that particular moment in time was Wapalo, 91, and Polk County had 76. Polk County obviously has the benefit of having other charities working inside Des Moines um, that will help kind of offset the need for people to go to the poor farm. But we see these interesting, uh, interesting kind of pockets. And some of the I would say probably derogatory comments about who lives at the poor farm are easy to find. So there's some shame attached in part because there's a fear of having to go there. You give up a lot of independence when you live at a poor farm, but there's also this element that people are judging you and kind of blaming you for your situation. And so there was one kind of little newspaper report that referred to people who lived at the poor farm uh, in these categories, referred to them as the poor, aged, freaks of nature, and mentally weak. And so we have two very accurate kind of comments there and then two that are, are very sort of subjective and, and really laced with um, derogatory terminology. Poor farms are interesting economic engines. Sometimes I say that and people are surprised. Poor farms are producing, uh, if it's a good farm, they're producing a lot of stuff for the market and stuff that they use inside the poor farm but they're also hiring people. Um, sometimes we've got full-time staff and sometimes we have part-time staff. Generally the anchor here is a superintendent or a steward and his wife who served as the matron. That is the very typical formula across the entire region. And if counties were lucky, that person was responsible, knew a little something about farming and his wife was a good housekeeper and a good sort of caretaker. And hopefully they had kids old enough to work. Sometimes the matron's salary is a separate line item. So we have women who are paid by counties to sort of provide this partnership with their husband as they both work at this institution. Sometimes they combine the salaries together, but they indicate in the contract that this is for both of you. This is X number of dollars for him and X number of dollars for her. 
we don't see those types of hiring uh, opportunities very often, and especially not in rural parts of the United States during this time period. Uh, kind of the closest symmetry is people who uh, lived and worked on Indian reservations and were hired to kind of overintend or superintend that circumstance. Sometimes counties will pay the bill for extra labor. This is very particular for the farms often. You see it more for hired hands helping with the farm production than you do servants or maids, people to work in the institution. But we've got counties that will pay those bills and then other counties opt for if the superintendent or steward wants to hire people to help him, it has to come out of his salary. So we've got counties that sometimes are spending hundreds of dollars a year on extra staff. And then sometimes there's a big old goose egg on that line item where that budget used to be. It varies widely depending on what's going on at the farm and what's going on at the institution. Neighbors picked up a lot of work at poor farms if they wanted it. We've got examples of neighbors who are installing the drain tiles, who are digging the ditches, who are doing fence work. Uh, we've got neighbors, neighbor women, and girls who are doing the cooking, the sewing, sometimes nursing. These are part-time gigs, but they're pumping a lot of cash that is hard to come by sometimes in rural parts of the county into people's households if you lived in the general vicinity of the poor farm. They are also buying groceries that they can't grow on the farm. They're buying clothing and other supplies. They're hiring doctors frequently on an annual contract. So a doctor gets one lump sum, to make X number of visits, maybe once a week or once a month, depending on the circumstance and the number of people. And so that person is a sort of separate paid employee whose budget item doesn't kind of come from the superintendent or steward salary at all. And sometimes, although it may seem surprising, we do have residents who are receiving pay to work inside the institution where they live. This is much more common for young women, particularly women who were there with small children or who were there to give birth. It seems maybe counterproductive, but it made really good fiscal sense to counties. It's in the county's best interest to facilitate as many people self-supporting outside the institution as possible. It costs counties more to have them in the poor farm. They don't want them on the doles at all. They want them out of the institution, off of relief, self-sustaining whenever possible. So if you have a young woman who is there with a baby and she has the possibility to maybe find a husband or be self-supporting through her own labor, that is what counties want. And so if they can give her a little kind of pocket money to get started on that path, they'll do it. And so far from being sort of against the principle of the poor farm, it actually behooves the county to help people get up and out. Uh, the same is true of younger men who maybe are there with an injury or an illness. You got a transient laborer who is there, but maybe has a chance to get back out. They might give that person some employment if they've got something kind of sitting around to do. It doesn't have to be a ton of money, just enough to kind of get that person back on their feet. And so counties saw that as a really good kind of long-term investment for their own pocketbook to not have people like that kind of stacked up uh, like cordwood essentially in the poor farm. The budget's really controlled by the county officials, but it's facilitated by the steward or superintendent. So we have county officials who are responsible for the overall budget. Sometimes they're responsible for deciding which businesses get money from the poor farm, where you buy your groceries, who the doctor is, for example, uh, every once in a while, there's a little kickback problem um, with some, uh, some bonuses being paid out from the county coffers, but there is oversight here. Some counties had really good county officials, people who visited regularly, who asked the residents questions about their care and kept a close watch on the farm because that is an investment for the county. Sometimes they dictate crop cycles. Uh, sometimes they decide what improvements are made um, to some of the county, uh, county property and some of the farm in particular. So it's a good time to talk about how the farm kind of enhances the form and function of the county home here. This image is from a newspaper article from Minnesota actually, that is bragging about the very productive Holstein herd that the St. Louis County farm had. Uh, they have prize winning bulls. He's in box number three, by the way. Um, and they have record setting milk production from some of these cows. This type of upgrade, which we would associate with, you know, people focused on the marketplace for their farm products is very common at poor farms. 
counties wanted not just the poor farm to produce stuff that went on the table in the kitchen at the poor farm, but also to sell so that they could have that money to offset the expenses of the farm. So we've got counties, uh, in particular, a couple from Iowa, Clinton County, $4,000 worth of farm products sold in a single year. That's money that Clinton County can use to offset their other expenses, poor or otherwise. Uh, and so it did counties a good service to have a productive farm, and they tended to invest when they could in improvements for the farm instead of improvements for the institutional structure. So sometimes, just like in farm homes during this period of time, the farm gets the upgrades first, better barn, uh, maybe a, a new milker of some kind, and then the institution will get what's left over. Across the Midwest on the whole, everyone who's really operating what might be recognized as an almshouse is really a poor farm. It has a farm attached. There are very few examples of counties that have just a little bit of land, five or 10 acres that's essentially a big garden. Most counties went out and made the investment in land like they meant it. 120 acres, 160 acres. Some of them bought two sections. We got 240 acres in Blackhawk County. They had a flock of 600 chickens, by the way, at some point, um, very profitable. So they are definitely focused on these being profitable farms whenever possible. But in order to have that happen, you had to hire a good steward. You had to hire someone who knew how to run a farm and you had to have purchased a good farm. Uh, you know, just like everyone else trying to scratch a living or profit out of land that is not particularly good is difficult. And some Iowa counties also suffered from those problems. One of the examples that I found, and it's not alone, is Sac County, 120 acres. It was noted as not being a profitable investment to the county. The stock was in bad shape. It really sounded like at this one moment in time, they'd hired maybe the wrong superintendent or the elected officials had done a poor job of maintaining the farm property. And so it was falling behind in terms of the output that county officials were really expecting and the way that it would kind of offset what they were trying to do. St. Louis County, for what it's worth here in Minnesota, is not the only one to have gone with the fancy Holstein herd. We've got counties that are upgrading to jerseys uh, to do butter. We've got counties upgrading different types of uh, pig stock. We have counties that are kind of specializing in things just like their farm neighbors are at the same time. And so there's an interesting array of counties, um, some of them investing in things like new barns. This is also a Minnesota uh, pair of images, but this picture was taken in part because it's an almost brand new barn. You can see they're working on hay. The superintendent, by the way, is the man wearing a tie. I suspect that that was not his day in and day out outfit, but since they had a photographer coming, I think he got a little gussied up. And this is one of his hired hands who's actually doing the work of moving the hay here on this particular day. But they also had residents. These are a couple of guys who live in this institution and they're working in the garden. They are not gonna be responsible for the entire process of the garden, but they are pitching in because they're able. Gave residents something to do, which was nice for a lot of them to feel like they were being useful, had an activity of some kind, was important. One of the things that poor farms will come, come under some scrutiny for is the amount of land that they have and the value of that land. In 1900, Iowa poor farms had between 15 and 20,000 acres of land. Obviously, none of that is taxed because it's owned by the county uh, for public welfare. Um, and the value of that land at that moment in time was a million dollars. Obviously, when we think about the appreciation of farmland over the 20th century, we can kind of start to recognize and understand, if you're not familiar, with the amount of money that counties were sitting on when they owned 240 acres of very productive farmland. So that notion that it was going to be an investment is not a one-time or one-year shot only. So yes, the farm provides food for the table that the residents eat, but it has the potential to provide way more from that land down the road than just kind of providing for folks who are living here. In many parts of the Midwest and many parts of Iowa, frankly, when I have been there, people have, people in a certain generation especially, have a particular memory of the poor farm or the county home as an institution. But by and large, younger generations have no kind of recollection of the poor farm as a threat for older people or the poor farm as a structure. 
we don't have many firsthand accounts of poor farm residents. It is one of the pieces of the sort of historical record of poor farms that I wish there was more of, but is really lacking. Some of that has to do with the literacy of residents. Um, some of it has to do with the, the idea that they didn't really want to remember this time in their lives. And some of it has to do with the fact that they had no one to leave those memories for or to. But we do have some interesting firsthand accounts, one of which actually comes from Iowa, a woman named Betty Groth Syverson, whose parents ran the Emmett County farm during the 1930s. So she grew up in part on that farm because her parents worked there. And she has some really interesting memories of being a child on the farm and her interactions with residents, which were almost universally positive. Um, she had really positive things to say about growing up in that environment, despite the fact that, by and large, people really wanted children to not live at poor farms. They didn't always necessarily consider the children of the employees as being someone who lived there. A lot of the images that you saw today came from postcards. Counties took pride in their institutions, and they tended to put the sort of picture front and center because they had visitors. County homes and poor farms hosted homecoming picnics and farmer appreciation weekends and 4th of July events. They were sometimes used as community and public space. They were open to the public. They wanted taxpayers to see what their money was going toward. They wanted residents to have a little bit of socialization. So they sometimes were very proud of the structure. The bottom picture here that I know is a little small is one from Ohio. This is Wayne County, which is in the eastern half of the state. You'll notice the architecture looks a little different from some of the Iowa institutions. It's got that tower on it. it serves no real purpose. Uh, it's just decorative. But they've brought everybody out to have this picture taken, and they printed this on a postcard that visitors could have and then send. Uh, there are hundreds of those postcards in circulation today on eBay and other places. Um, we've got guest books when people visited the poor farm, they would sign in. Uh, genealogists obviously have been enormously helpful in facilitating the transcription of records, uh, the saving of records, and sometimes obviously the saving of buildings. Um, we've got, I found this really great plate. I actually have it with me. I have, it's right here in my office. I keep it with me. Uh, this is uh, the county house uh, that was printed on a plate for commemoration in the 1980s. Uh, which is sort of interesting. This is Union County's building. They were doing a series to fundraise of important buildings that had been in the county. And so they used the county home as one of those examples, which is an interesting way of commemorating the building itself uh, and, the, and what it meant to people who were kind of remembering it in the 1980s. Frequently, um, we've got the cemetery for the poor farm as the only remaining piece that we can maybe see physically on the land or see on a map. But obviously some, I know Johnson County in particular, have been turned into museums and it's not alone. There are others across the region that serve as county office space, a couple of their jails, um, a couple that are historical societies or museums, some that are just county offices. And so when we look for poor farms, sometimes we're a little bit kind of hard pressed to figure out where they were uh, and how we can find them. And so to close, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why poor farms are no longer with us. There are a couple of reasons. Um, one that I have sort of already mentioned, which is that other types of aid are made available to certain groups of people. So we have mothers who are receiving mother's aid. We've got children in orphanages. We've got state asylums for the mentally ill. We've got other options for a lot of groups of people that start to kind of filter out some of the population. But then we also have, in 1935, the Social Security Act which did not specifically mention poor farms, but it did have a line item in it that if you were going to be eligible for social security, you could not live in a public institution. Poor farms were full of people who were eligible for the new social security payments. And so counties used this as an opportunity to get those people off the county docket, get them off of county money and onto federal money or state money. And so it facilitated this change of responsibility. Who's paying the bill? It's not the county anymore. It's someone else kind of up the line. And so that was going to save counties a lot of money. So they facilitated moving people to private nursing care, private boarding homes, sometimes even apartments or group homes that would take Social Security money because they didn't count as being public institutions. So that transition in 1935 and the years that follow is a big turning point for a lot of poor farms. We also have that changing population of people who are older, people who are dealing with chronic health problems, 
and people who needed different types of care. That type of care is expensive. And so for counties to have to foot the bill for that type of care, predominantly healthcare again, um, they were struggling. They also have buildings that are not meant for that type of 20th century healthcare. We've got buildings that are not wheelchair accessible. We have buildings that don't have elevators, buildings that you can't roll a sort of hospital bed through easily. They were designed for kind of a 19th century purpose and now they're trying to be outfitted or retrofitted for a 20th century use. So a lot of counties decided it's not worth it. We can tear this one down and build a nursing home. We can tear this down and rent the farm. We can tear this down and turn it into the site for our jail, our county mental health facility. We've got landfills on poor farms. We've got airports on poor farms. The county already owned the land. Land hasn't gotten any cheaper. So they use that land for the new purposes and the new things that their counties need. And so we see that all across the region. As poor farms close and kind of end that institutional purpose, it's not because the type of people who live there automatically disappeared. They just went to other types of institutions and they were receiving different types of aid and assistance. And so they're being kind of filtered out of institutional care at the county level and they're becoming kind of some other levels responsibility. And then the investment that these counties made in land really was viewed as an investment that they could use for lots of other things. And so very few remain as kind of poor farm structures today. There are a couple for what it's worth who are actually still housing people as residents. Um, not many, a handful truly across the entire region that provide things like adult daycare service that is paid for by counties that has a farm attached that they're renting or they've used it for other purposes. Um, lots of county animal shelters, for example, located on former poor farm land. Um, and sometimes adult daycare or short overnight kind of shelter situations that counties are using a couple of them for today. So they are sometimes still with us as a physical presence, um, but are more often than not uh, kind of off the physical landscape. And so they tend to sort of fall out of people's historical memory as well. So I'm gonna close there so that we have time for questions uh, and hopefully answers that I can provide. Um, but I wanna thank everyone so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Megan. I absolutely enjoyed that. That was awesome. Um, we'd have time to answer some questions. Um, so if you do have a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature on Zoom, but please note we may not be able to get to all the questions today. Uh, so first off, we've had a few folks wondering, and you kind of mentioned this um, before your last slide, uh, we have a few folks wondering where they can find photos of poor farms in their area. Uh, do you have any suggestions on where they should search? And also, did you have a favorite source or archive when doing your research? Well, we'll start with the photos. Um, so sometimes your public library or your county historical society will have some. Uh, it may be tucked into a collection about county buildings. Um, occasionally, there were some county histories that Iowa counties did uh, right around 1900, where they occasionally printed a photo of the new building, sometimes they were new at that time, or a sketch of some kind, so you can kind of get the lay of the land. Um, unfortunately, there used to be, this is probably 15 years ago now, there used to be a website that facilitated uh, almost crowdsourcing for poor farm history, different county historical groups would participate. And they had a lot of pictures, but that website is now defunct. I don't really know what happened to the person who was using it or running it. Um, and so that used to be a source where when people were looking for a really specific county image, they might be able to go there, but it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so the closest, the best place to check is to start local. Uh, and see if anyone has it. Uh, I've known people to use Facebook to ask if anyone happens to have an image of the old county home and every once in a while there's been some success there. Um, so if you happen to be on social media and you've got a, a sort of a county history page, they might be able to help as well. Um, the, the issue of the sources is a great question. Um, I do have a favorite source. There, um, there is a poor farm outside of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, where the two long running superintendents kept a daily diary. So the first gentleman started the diary in the 1870s and he wrote in it every single day until he suffered some kind of injury on the farm, which killed him. I think he got kicked in the head is my kind of piecing together what happened. So they brought in someone else who grabbed that man's diary, drew a line under his last entry and started fresh. Uh, he was there for years, every single day, like clockwork. He wrote from the mundane 
this happened today, it was frustrating, to the really heart-wrenching. Um, he had to fire some employees because they broke a couple of rules. Um, he lost a child while he worked there. His wife gave birth, the baby got sick. Um, he wrote that down in there. So I got this very personal glimpse at not just what it was like to work there, but he writes about the residents in a way that is very accessible. He, he liked them for the most part. There were some he didn't like, um, but he was compassionate and I think had pretty good judgment uh, from a historical distance as best I can tell. And so the, that pair of records from those two gentlemen in Dane County was invaluable. Um, it really helped kind of lift a curtain because we don't have many firsthand resident accounts. Watching those those sort of employee records and accounts happen was was really uh, vital. It gave a much more personalized feel to what I was working on. And so that was by far my favorite source. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we probably have time for one or two more questions. We'll kind of see how the time goes here. We've had so many great questions, everyone. So I'm apologizing. That <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm like, we've had so many great questions, but this next question, I guess, can kind of help out with a lot of people's other questions. Um, we had a question specifically about the Mahaska County poor farm. Mm. Um, do you know if it, is it a, still a cemetery and where is it located? And if you don't know, or we can also, if you do, what are some suggestions to find out more about this information? Mm, so I don't know specifically, but I will say that sometimes if I'm trying to figure out where the poor farm was, I look to see where the county still owns property. Sometimes I actually just use Google Earth. I will look for a county landfill or a county cemetery that's labeled county cemetery. Um, every once in a while, you'll find a county poor farm road. It's still labeled that way on the map. Um, I will look for any type of county land use that's in a spot where you think, why do they own that there? Because sometimes that's where the poor farm was. Um, and so sometimes you can find someone who can kind of help trace that history back. Uh, why does the county own this? Oh, what well, was the county farm? Um, if you know that your county had a nursing home that maybe has been privatized since, but you know that it started as the county nursing home, that property may be the old poor farm property. A lot of them went through that evolution. Um, so those are the ways sometimes when I'm looking for one, I go to look for a landfill or an airport or um, an animal shelter that's outside of a town, uh, maybe on a county road or a state highway. And I, I kind of start to poke around and see if I can find any other remnants of what might be there, because sometimes that really does help. You might not see many structures, but sometimes there's an old barn. I know this is the case in my home county in Ohio. The nursing home is there. But there's an old barn from like clearly the early 1900s in the back of the property that doesn't match the nursing home. And I mean, I know because I'm from there, but if I didn't, that would be one of the things as a historian I was looking for is a sort of mismatch of structures. Like, why are they all there? Uh, and so sometimes that can help. Awesome. Thank you, Megan. We do have time for one more quick question. Uh, we've had a few questions, a little bit about the naming conventions. Um, so like when... Uh, were all county homes at this time considered poor farms? And kind of when did the name change occur in Iowa from poor farm to more county care facility? So that first change in Iowa from poor farm to county home happens by the late 1800s and early 1900s. We see a lot of counties making that change and they're doing it, they're making a concerted effort. They didn't want people who lived there to feel like they were all being labeled as poor. When some of them are old or some of them are sick, there are different reasons to be there that are not specifically poverty. Um, but the, the naming conventions everywhere are very confusing. Ohio made that jump, but instead of going to county home, they went to county infirmary, which was meant to sort of designate the healthcare component. Uh, California did the same thing. They moved to the phrase county hospital. So there was sometimes a hospital there, but it was also a poor farm. So sometimes if you see county hospital, especially in the early 1900s, you may be dealing with kind of a joint institution that's doing both of those things. Um, but when you crack open, uh, for example, a U.S. census from 1910 or 1903, they did a special institutional census and they provide a huge list of all of the institutions in each state. And you can run through the names and see that there are still counties that are referring to it as the county almshouse or the county poor farm or the this or the that. Uh, sometimes it's called an asylum, which is a, you know, a designation that we use for mental illness during this, this period in the past, but wasn't a great designation for the, the purpose it was serving then, but they used it anyway. So you can actually sometimes see that breakdown across states of who's using old naming conventions and who's made the switch. Um, but it does happen 
in this window kind of in the 1890s and early 1900s, we get, we get places making that move and states are recommending it. Again, they can't force anyone to do it, but they're making that recommendation. Awesome, thank you. And with that answer, we will bring this webinar to a close. Thank you to everyone joining us today. And we would like to extend one last thank you to our presenter, Megan. It was very, very interesting. Uh, we hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are so many great stories to tell in the upcoming months. For more information and to register for future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. While you are there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as Goldie's Kids Club Activities for Young Historians. We look forward to virtually seeing you for the next Iowa History 101 webinar, the first during Iowa History Month on March 9th. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon.